Hey there! Welcome to Learning with Maz, where you can learn and upskill yourself. In this series, we are going to discuss some basic chemical engineering concepts to help you to perform mass balance applications. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe and click the bell to enable alerts so you can keep learning with me. Let's jump right into it. Process engineering has to do with using raw materials, applying a bunch of very important principles to produce the final product. One of the fundamental concepts used to make sure that the final product is what we want is mass balances. There are various methods of performing a mass balance depending on the type of chemical process, the process operation, and whether there is a reaction. In this video, we will be doing an example of a continuous non-reactive process operating a steady state. The purpose is to show you how to do a properly presented solution for a mass balance problem in seven steps. For any material balance application, you will need to apply the principle of conservation of mass, which states that accumulation is equal to input plus generation minus output minus consumption. For a continuous process, which is always a steady state, there is no accumulation because what goes in, goes out again. When there is no reaction taking place, there is no generation of outputs or consumption of inputs. That leaves us with input is equal to output, which means that the mass and the moles must balance around the system. Let's look at a continuous, non-reactive, single unit mass balance example, which we will solve using the properly presented solution format. Feel free to pause the video so that you can try and work it out yourself first. For a properly presented solution, you need to read the question thoroughly and to draw a process flow diagram or flow chart to fully understand the problem. In this example, we are told that the process unit is an evaporation chamber with three input streams and one output stream. So, we draw a box to represent the chamber and we label it. We must add arrows going into the box to represent the input stream and an arrow leaving the box for the output stream. This diagram is called a PFD. The next step is to label the PFD. I like to use numbers so that the notation goes along with the stream number, followed by the component label for each stream. Lastly, we can add the detailed stream variables which are included in the example. We are given the volumetric flow rate of the water stream, stream 3, as 20 cubic centimeters per minute. We are also given the molar composition of air, so we will write the flow rate of stream 2 in terms of moles. The example states that the pure oxygen stream is a fraction of the air stream, so we can write out the relationship in terms of moles as well. Lastly, we're told that the composition of the humid air, stream 4, is 1.5 mole percent, so we will use a molar flow rate for stream 4 as well. Please note the flow rate notation. In general, M, N, and V are used for mass, moles, and volume respectively. Placing a dot above these letters represents a flow rate. In this case, stream 2 is written as a molar flow rate and stream 3 is a volumetric flow rate. The given compositions are in terms of moles. It is common practice to use X for mass fractions and Y for molar fractions, followed by the component and the stream number. For example, the molar fraction of water in stream 4 is 0.015. Labeling like this helps to clear up any confusion when you're doing your calculations. The third step is to write down what you solve for, using the same variable annotations described previously. The example tells us to draw and label the flowchart of the process, which we have done and it's something that we should always do, and to calculate all the unknown stream variables. In this question, we do not know the flow rates of streams 1, 2 and 4 and the molar composition of nitrogen. We do know that the components in a stream must add up to 100% or a fraction of 1. So we can assume that once we know the molar composition of nitrogen, we can deduce the molar composition of oxygen. We can also assume that stream 3 is pure water, so it has a molar fraction of 1. Because we have been given a volumetric flow rate and we want to work in terms of moles, 
we do not really classify the molar flow rate of scene 3 as an unknown variable, but it does require some sort of unit conversion from volume to moles first before we can use it. The fourth step is to write down all the component and overall balance equations to do a degree of freedom analysis. Since we have three components, we will have three component balances of water, nitrogen, and oxygen in the form of input is equal to output. Adding these three balances gives us the overall equation. That means that we have a total of three independent equations with four unknowns, equating to a degree of freedom of one. Fortunately, we were given extra information, which means we have three independent equations and one extra information to solve for four unknowns. So we can solve this question as we move from one degree of freedom to zero. This is called a degree of freedom analysis, which we will discuss later in the series when dealing with multiple units. The fifth step is to form a basis or to convert the one that's given to you if necessary. A basis refers to the amount of material in a stream or a flow rate that you can assume or use to do a mass balance for the whole system. In this case, there is no need to assume a flow rate because we have been given one in terms of volume. Seeing that we want the solution in terms of moles, we need to convert the volumetric flow rate to a molar flow rate using the density and molar mass of the components in the stream, which is just water in this case. Using the density helps us to calculate the mass flow rate of stream 3. And the molar mass helps us to find the molar flow rate of stream 3. Forming a basis can also affect your degree of freedom analysis as it usually gives you enough tools to solve the problem. Once you have all the necessary equations and you know you can solve the problem, you should start with solving for the easy unknowns first. In our case, that is the water balance. We know the input flow rate of water and the output composition, so we can solve for the molar flow rate of stream 4. Next up, we can do an overall balance because we get to use the extra information and the fact that we know streams 3 and 4 to solve for stream 2. Using the extra information, we can solve for stream 1 with the calculated stream 2 value. Finally, we can do a nitrogen balance because unlike oxygen, nitrogen is only in two streams and it's easier to solve. We know all the other variables, so we can solve for the molar composition of nitrogen. We can then use our knowledge that components or species in a stream add up to 1 to solve for the molar composition of oxygen in stream 4. The last step is to double check your mass balance. We are going to use the oxygen balance to do so. We know the two input streams of oxygen and the molar flow rate of stream 4. So we can calculate the molar composition of oxygen in stream 4 to see if it matches the value calculated previously. Substituting all the known variables gives us a molar fraction of 0 0.3365. Please note that when you are rounding off using a 5, you should not round off the subsequent value if it will be an odd number. Meaning, if the 6 was a 7, then the 5 could have been used to round off the 7 to an 8. However, Rounding off in this case will give us a 7, which is an odd number, so we leave it as it is. This is a rule in significant figures according to Falda. The final result matches our initial calculation, so we are done here in 7 steps. Let's recap. To do a properly presented solution, you need to draw and label a PFD, Write down what to solve for, write down all the necessary equations to do a degree of freedom analysis, form a basis or convert the one that's given to you if necessary, solve for the easy unknowns first, and double check your mass balance. There's a whole mountain of concepts that you need to be familiar with to follow the 7-step mass balance approach. 
Besides knowing how to do simultaneous equations, drawing and labeling the PFD requires you to be familiar with the types of diagrams and process units in engineering. Writing down what to solve for requires a good understanding of process variables. Forming a basis requires knowledge of units and dimensions. Unit conversion is a big part of mass balances. When doing the actual calculations, knowing your significant figures plays a huge role in whether your mass balances or not. In the next video, we'll be focusing on unit conversions. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Remember that sharing is caring. This video might help someone. See you next time. Bye.